Tonight, Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 20 through the end of the chapter. Would you read along with me, please? Paul writes, You, however, did not come to know Christ that way. Surely you heard of him and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, whenever there's a therefore, it's therefore a reason. Here's the reason. Each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. He who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with his own hands. That's the transformation, that he may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness. Would you highlight that? Underline it, please. Get rid. It's an action you're being asked to take. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. Tonight, Jesus, we truly need your spirit. We need to know that the power that raised Christ from the dead lives within us. May we have the faith tonight to access that power. Lord, in order to do that, we've got to get rid of the old junk and put on all the new stuff. Truth is, Lord, when we do that, we're going to look really, really good. And tonight you give us a formula for joy, for happiness, for contentment. You give us a formula for plugging in to the power of your spirit that lives within each and every one of us. Oh God, let us be grateful Help us to love you more than we've ever loved you before. I join with David in asking, Lord, that if there's even one in this room tonight or any who are watching um, by live streaming, if they don't know you, if they've not yet made that commitment, please, God, open your arms so wide that they can't miss the invitation. And finally, Jesus, since tonight deals with such practical things. Give us ears to hear and help us to understand your heart in order that we may bring you honor and glory. Oh, Lord, how we love you. Oh, how we love you. And we are grateful for all you've done and continue to do. Lord, bless this time of study. We pray this for your glory. Amen. On Sunday here at church, uh, Raul and Linda Romero, who were sitting right behind me, they were sitting where they were on Sunday. Uh, Linda got up, I said hello to her just as we were getting ready to, to, to go back into worship. And I said, oh, you look so beautiful. I haven't seen that dress before. And she had this beautiful blue dress on. And she looked at me, she said something that I had to go to her today and ask her to explain. She said, this is my pity dress. And I said, pity dress. And today she explained it happened at a time when they had gone through a disappointment. And they were feeling just a little bit low. And so she and Raul went out and bought her a new dress. Now that works. New clothes work. In my business, instead of giving people bonuses of money, I would buy them new suits. 
Because the money, if I gave it to them, would be gone. But if I got them a new suit, they looked good and they felt good and they behaved better and they were motivated, you know. They thought they looked really good, so they started to do better. Buying new clothes works. Well, tonight, and this will continue into the next chapters, Jesus wants to buy us all new clothes. It's sort of like he's saying, okay, Calvary Chapel, here is a dress code. I walked into the, the school today here at the office, and, and everybody was dressed differently. You know, we've got a school uniform, and nobody had them. Normally, I can tell if it's sports day or pajama day or anything like that, but, but today it was just like regular day. <laughs> and I said, what's the, what's the deal with the clothing? Why are they wearing this? And my answer was, well, today is casual Friday. Now, I promise you this. Now, your kids are wonderful, so don't misunderstand me. But if we had a dress-up Friday, they would behave better on that Friday than they do on casual Friday. New clothes works. You just feel good, look good, and you want to be good. It's just sort of the way it is. So tonight, Jesus gives you, Calvary Chapel, a dress code really a formula for all those things I spoke about. For joy, for happiness, for contentment, a formula to stay plugged into the power of God every minute of every day. Jesus simply says, let's take you in the back, let's put on some new clothes, and we'll all just marvel at how good you look. Tonight, we get some new clothes. Paul says, you, however, did not come to know Christ that way. Surely you heard of him and were taught in him in accordance with the truth, not a truth or some truth, but the truth that is in Jesus. He says, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self. Now, I talk about change a lot from this pulpit. People that say they're Christians, but their life hasn't changed. They're kidding themselves. We can't keep being who we used to be and then believe somehow that we've come to met Jesus because we did something. I got baptized or I grew up in church or, or I, I answered an altar call. When you meet Jesus, you change. Now, Paul would know that about the Ephesians. Remember, he spent more than three years with this church. And he starts out tonight by saying, it's almost like he's, look, I know how you were raised. I mentioned in our study last Friday night when we touched on these last verses, it's like, I raised you better than that. And so he says, remember how you were raised. And the key here is truth. It's a key element in the rest of this book. When we get through into chapter 5 starting next week and then all the way through the last chapter, there is so much. And, and we're going to slow way, way down. But all of it is designed to help you walk in the newness of life. There's no point in getting all dressed up, going out and rolling around in the dirt, and then coming to somebody and saying, hey, don't I look good? No, you don't look good. Paul says newness of life requires change. Here's the change that was necessary. And he says in verse 22 that they have to put off the old self. The idea here, and it's a very familiar theme in the Apostle Paul's epistles. It's like changing clothes. Your old ones are dirty. You've got someplace important to be. We can't put on the old filthy clothes. We've got to put on the new stuff, and here's why. Of the old you, the old clothing, it is said, it is being corrupted by its deceitful desires. Old clothes are just old clothes. You know, there's things that we have and they're comfortable, we wear them at home, but we wouldn't dare go outside in them. And the reason we wouldn't go outside is because, well, those are old clothes. It'd be a little bit embarrassing to go out. I've got a, a T-shirt. The, the best T-shirt's a long sleeve shirt. It's an NFL shirt. Paula's brother sent it to me as a gift all those years ago when he worked for the NFL. And, and, and it's the best T-shirt I've ever had. It has holes in the elbows so big that I can almost crawl through them. <laughs> But I'm not throwing away that old t-shirt. <laughs> but I wouldn't wear it out 
to a nice event either. Paul says, because we feel so much better in new clothes, that's the way we ought to live our lives. Now, practically speaking, Christians, it means that we should no longer feel like we belong at your old bar or hanging out with your old friends, those that you got in trouble with. And if you're honest, let me change that. When we're honest, because Christ lives in you, when you go do those old things, isn't it true you feel kind of dirty? You know you don't belong there, but you're sitting there and you're wondering, well, why am I here? And it's not fun like I thought it would be. But you do it just because you put on the old clothes and forgot that you had a whole new set of clothes waiting in your closet. If you are really saved, there has to be a clean break from our past. It should happen quickly. Even if you're holding on to some of those old things, as was the case in my life, it just became so obvious that I didn't belong there. Listening to the kind of language, listening to the stories, doing the same kinds of things that I did before I met Jesus. And what I realized was that if I was going to be at that place that I didn't belong, then I had to leave Jesus outside and I didn't want to be anywhere without him. And that's really something that we've got to understand. Now, will we ever fall? Probably. For most of us, certainly. But falling occasionally or falling once or twice is a lot different than living a life of going back to the old places, hanging out with the old friends, doing the old things. It's a lot different than just calling your old friends and planning a night out like the old times. It's far different than accepting a date with an unbeliever who you know expects sex at the end of the date because that's what unbelievers do. And so when we plan those things, then we're putting on the old raggedy clothes, the stinky clothes. And Jesus can't go with us wherever it is we go. Instead, he says this in verse 23. We're to be made new in the attitude of our minds. Paul used to have an old t-shirt. Romans 12, 2, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. And I don't know what happened to that t-shirt, but it was one of my favorites. And it had a cartoon character, and he had really big ears. And in those ears, he had a towel going through his, his ears like this. And had Romans 12, 2 on it. He, he was cleaning his mind. We need to do that every day when we're starting to think like we used to think, when we're starting to reminisce about how much fun the old days used to be. We need to, figuratively speaking, get that towel and sort of clean out our brain so that we can be made new in the attitude of our minds and then we can change clothes, he says in verse 24, and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Now, we often see people come forward responding to invitations or altar calls. Sometimes we'll see the same people come time and time again. Paula will tell you that she answered seven altar calls before she finally figured that she saved enough. And part of the reason we do that is because we still look like the old us. We're still wearing the old clothes instead of looking like God in true righteousness and holiness. Now, why do we have those faux pas, those things where we slip back into the old life? Well, it's because we feel differently, like Linda with her pity dress. She was in a, a moment of disappointment, and so she did something to make her feel better. Well, we have to realize that emotions don't change who we are. Being sad, crying, or feeling bad doesn't make us a believer. What identifies us as a believer is this new clothing that I'm talking about. That's what true conversion is. When you meet Jesus, and I mean you truly meet him, everybody here knows about him, but when you really, really meet him, you know what happens? You hate your sin. You just hate it. And you feel like a fish out of water sort of flopping around. But Paul says, no, put on the new self. Go where you know you're supposed to go, looking like you're supposed to look, and everything will change. If there has been no change in your life, and this is going to be a constant 
theme throughout the rest of the book of Ephesians. If you're still having fun doing the things that you did before you profess Christ, if your marriage hasn't changed, if there's still that kind of enmity between a husband and a wife in a professing Christian marriage, then you need to be honest about the condition of your walk so you can examine your heart, letting the Holy Spirit shed light on those dark areas in your heart. Conversion means we begin finally to agree with God. That's what it means to be born again. We get a brand new you. The old man, the old woman dies, and the new you comes to life. And because of all of that, verse 25 says, here's what your new clothing looks like. Therefore, you must, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor, for we are all members of one body. When I was about 10 years old, I found out just how much trouble you could get in for lying. My mom had a rule that we had to eat everything she put on her plate. And you were going to sit at that table until you ate everything. Well, I'm sitting at that table. Mom had given us that particular meal, pork chops. And not only did I not like pork chops, I wanted to go do something else. And my mom would just say, no, Ronnie, you can't leave until you've eaten everything on your plate. So I started getting creative. I ate the stuff that I could eat really quickly with the pork chop. I just didn't. So I figured, I know what I'll do. We ate in the kitchen back then. And I threw the pork chop behind the refrigerator. And I said, Mom, I'm done. Now, I'd been sitting there for over an hour complaining about eating this pork chop. Okay, I'm done. So she came in. She said, you cleaned your plate? I said, Mom, here's my plate. It's clean. And she said, well, what happened to the bone? (laughs) At 10, you don't come up with the greatest lies. So my lie was, I ate it. (laughs) I couldn't think of anything else. She didn't believe it. That won't shock you. (laughs) And she made me sit there until I told her the truth. You got to put off lying. Now, as Christians, we make excuses for lying all the time. Everybody does it. How can I get along in this world if I don't lie? If I don't lie, people are going to take advantage of me. And, and, you know, I've got to have an equal playing field. I mean, however we rationalize it, he says, part of your new clothing, you want to look really good. You've got to stop lying. Lying is a Christian tragedy. Exaggerating is a lie. Not telling the whole truth is a lie. And Paul says, in these new clothes, lying simply is inappropriate. Why is it that we've lost so much of the power of our witness? Well, sadly, the truth is that we lie about things as much or more as people who are not believers. Consider, according to Barna Research of California, 32% of Americans say that lying is sometimes necessary. Did you get that number? 32% listen to this. Barna says 35% of people who call themselves born-again Christians to get by these days say that, well, you have to bend the rules and lie sometimes or you're going to be at a disadvantage. So you've got to lie sometimes and it's really not that big a deal. 35%, that's 3% more than the unbelieving world. Now here's what we've got to really, really consider Jesus said that the devil is the father of lies. Now, I think we all tell little white lies. But as believers, we're misrepresenting the Lord. When we do, we're putting on those old clothes and we're trying to go to a place that requires our new clothing. We wonder why the Holy Spirit's not active in our lives. We wonder why nobody's getting saved. It's because we're quenching the power of the Holy Spirit with something as simple as lie. How can it possibly be that Christians consider lying is not that big a deal? The question we all have to answer individually, because all of this is a struggle. 
taking off the old clothes, putting on the new clothes. After I got saved, I was running a dealership in Tustin, California. And I called all of my guys together and told them that if anybody lies, one lie, they're fired. And you'd have thought that I shocked them all. The man that hired me to fix the dealership called me into his office and said, well, you were just trying to scare them, right? And I said, no. He said, well, you know, you, you have to lie to sell cars. And I said, you hired me. You told me I could do it my way. If they lie, they're fired. That's just the way it's got to be. Christians, we cannot be like other people. I think the sad truth is that too many of us think of themselves first as individuals, considering what's in it for us first. Second, we consider ourselves as Americans, and third, as Christians. And if you don't think that's true, listen to all of the nonsense coming out of Christian mouths about this election mess that we're in the middle of. If we consider ourselves Christians first, remember Christ man, Christ woman, if we consider ourselves Christians first, then we wouldn't have such a cavalier attitude about lying. Why shouldn't Christians lie? Paul says, because we all belong to one another and we can't lie to ourselves. Now you can try to fool yourself for a time, but the truth is, you know when you're doing the right thing, you know when you're doing the wrong thing, no matter how you justify it or rationalize it. A human body, that's the picture we're gonna get in our Corinthians studies on Sunday. Uh, Paul used it to illustrate how a body works together. Can you imagine if I had this really, really terrible itch and I tried to tell my hand to scratch the itch and my hand kept saying, you don't itch. A body can't lie to one another. We're a pillar and foundation of the truth the body of Christ is. And that means we have to be men and women who are truth tellers. You want the formula for being happy, for being content, for living a life connected to power. you got to stop lying. Next, verse 26 says, In your anger, do not sin. I want you to note, before we start talking about this, that being angry is not a sin. Jesus was angry. He was angry a lot. Turning over money changers' tables, looking at Pharisees and Sadducees and calling a brood of snakes whitewashed sepulchers. He was angry a lot. There was so much to be angry about. And I think sometimes we try to rationalize our own anger. We say, well, Jesus got angry. Well, I don't think you can compare your anger to his righteous anger. He says, in your anger, do not sin. Anger is normal. It's a human emotion. Jesus was angry that the traditions of the religious Jews were more important than the word of God, more important even than the people of God, Israel. He was angry that people were being taken advantage of. Anger can be good and it can be righteous. But we have to be careful because when we get angry, we sort of go insane. I've had people tell me over the years, well, I, I just can't help it. God made me this way. I have a hot temper. And my response is always this way, we'll, we'll get saved. Because the old you dies, and then there's a new you. And so you can put that ugly old you to bed, and then you can walk in the newness of life, and you don't have to be angry anymore. Or at least we can take our angry thoughts captive and make them obedient to Christ. It's never okay to sin in your anger. There is never an excuse for it no matter how hard you try to make it. Later in this book, in chapter 6, we're going to talk about parenting and discipline. You should never, moms and dads, discipline your children in anger. When you are angry, give you the time out, not the kids. You go take a walk and pray with Jesus. Get your heart right, get your mind right, 
And then you can go into your children, who you, I'm sure, have every rightful reason to be angry with them, but then you can rightly represent Jesus in the process. Discipline is a good thing. Spanking is a godly thing. But never, ever, when you're angry. Husbands and wives, when you're angry at one another, it's best to be quiet. It's best to go someplace and pray, to open God's word before you say something that you're really and truly going to regret. The old clothes is the way you used to behave. I've said this not for shock value, but, but I want you to realize how serious it is. Imagine the things that your children have heard their mother and father say to and about one another in the privacy of their home. And we rationalize it. Well, I'm sorry, but you know, it just, I just couldn't believe what she did. I still have nightmares at times about something my dad said to me about my mother when I was in Little League. And I couldn't believe he said it to me. And here I am no longer in Little League and it still has an effect on me. When you give in to your anger, it's not because you have to. It's because you won't do what the Word of God tells you to do. Anger can be and must be controlled and sin will be prevented. And here's one of the ways to prevent it. He says, do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. Now that's a really simple rule. You want to look good when you get up in the morning? Deal with the anger at night. Deal with it righteously. Deal with it according to the word of God. But, but don't go to bed angry. You know, if I go to bed angry, I wake up angrier. So these are things that we've got to deal with. And again, I know how we justify it and rationalize it. Well, he did this or she did this. But if you deal with it before you go to bed, if you invite Jesus in, here's something you're going to hate hearing me say. If you're really angry, the two of you sit down and pray. I know about you, but it's really embarrassing to go before the Lord in prayer when I got all this unrighteous anger in me. And so what we've got to do is just deal with it. Lay it down at the feet of the Lord and say, God, I don't want to sin in my anger and I'm afraid I'm going to. And you know what God will do? He'll look at you and he will say, well, how important is this really? In the overall scheme of things, how important really is this? And the conclusion you'll come to always, it's not that important. Pleasing you, Jesus, is far more important. And here's the reason that we have to deal with it before we go to bed. Verse 27 says, And do not give the devil a foothold. When we go to bed angry, when we don't deal with anger, when we sort of put it off, the enemy has a stranglehold. He's got a, a stronghold in your life. And he's going to capitalize on it. He's going to see a weakness and he's going to take advantage of it. Peter says he's as a roaring lion prowling around seeking for whom he can devour the right time to devour you. And when he sees anger, he's going to start pushing buttons. You know, one of the things that just kills me about the devil is that he never stops pushing buttons. My brain is like an old tape recorder. I'm low tech. And there's always a play and a rewind. I think sometimes we forget there's also a stop button. And so sometimes at the most awkward time, Jesus will, I mean, the, the devil will play, will, will press play, and those old thoughts will come running back. And then he'll press rewind and over and over and over. And Jesus says, hey, let me press, press stop. That's a picture that's always worked for me. I don't want the devil pushing my buttons. And I don't know about you, but I don't think the devil needs a foothold in destroying me. He already does a pretty good job of trying. I want to make it more difficult for him rather than making it easier for him. Satan doesn't need any help. We get practical verse 28. He or she who's been stealing must steal no longer, 
but must work, there's the transformation, doing something useful with his own hands that he may have something to share with those in need. So he says, look, you thief, put off stealing. Put on work. It's easier to steal sometimes, isn't it? Until you get caught. I've stolen way too many things in my life. Before I became a believer, way too many things. And you try to justify it and you rationalize it, but there's just this dark cloud. And instead of stealing, he says, let's work. That's the transformation. When you meet Jesus, okay, you forgive me of stealing? Okay, I'm not going to steal anymore. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to work. That's what happens with conversion. It's okay to benefit personally from your work. It's a good thing, but benefiting personally can't be your only motive. He says, stop stealing, go to work, so that you have something to share with others. Remember that what you work for belongs to God, and it gives you an opportunity to be obedient in your giving. You can help people out and imagine how much better that feels than stealing something and then having to wonder or worry about when you're going to get caught. Here's one of my personal pet peeves, verse 29. Do not let any unwholesome talk, if you have a King James, I like that better, it says corrupt communication come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Now imagine you're walking into a changing room in a store. You found the perfect dress or the perfect suit and you're ready to see just how good you look in it. But before you do, now I don't know about you. Now maybe it's just because I'm getting so old. But every time I look in those mirrors in those dressing rooms because they're so close up to them, you're excited about your new clothes. You turn around and you look and you see just how horrible you look. Well, that's what Paul is saying. When we're using foul language, we're choosing to remain looking horrible. We got the opportunity to try on something new and look completely different, look to completely better. But no, we choose to look awful. There is nothing as unbecoming as a believer who uses foul language. There's nothing. Now, we know that from the pulpits of the United States of America, many pastors decided, well, you know, it's cool. You've got to be relevant. And this is the way people talk. And so that's what they do. I always keep waiting for lightning bolts to come down. We can't talk that way. Now, I'm going to tell you this isn't because I'm spiritual. I've cursed one time in the 29 years I've been saved. One time. It was at Bible college, counseling a young Bible college student. And a word came out of my mouth. And I don't know who was more shocked, me or him. But I saw what it did to him. I saw the impact that it had. And I was broken. And Jesus gave me a picture. I want to give this picture to you. He said, Ron, you saw what that word did to him. But here's what it did to me. I was standing between you and him. That word defiled me first. I can tell you now, I cussed all the time. Horrible language. I was a ball player. I was a car dealer. That was the last time I ever said an ugly word. because I didn't want to defile Jesus anymore. He who had washed me clean, I'm going to puke all over him with my ugly carnal flesh. Guys, we've got to be different. You get angry, it's not an excuse to, to defile Jesus. It's not an excuse to use foul language. Everybody else using it is not an excuse for you to do it. 
We've got to be mindful of our witness. But more than that, we've got to be mindful. And let me make up a word here. We've got to be heartful about what that does to Jesus when we diminish his goodness to us by using foul language. When Paul says to put off filthy talk or unwholesome talk, literally it's talk that's good for nothing. If you use foul language, and let me also say this, there are new words that have replaced really old, ugly words And we Christians somehow feel comfortable using those words. There's no way we can feel comfortable. It's like going to a formal dinner and you got gravy stains all over your tuxedo. We've got to be mindful of whose we are. Now this takes in a lot of ground. And if I offend, uh, I'm not really sorry, but, but I don't mean to be offensive. But, but some jokes, especially those with sexual innuendo, there's just no reason that needs to come out of our mouths as believers. Harsh words, that's unwholesome talk. Sarcasm. And I, I, I really have to watch myself here because that's just the way my mind works. And I have to be really careful because I don't know how somebody else is going to take it. And I don't want to hurt somebody that really belongs to Jesus. Those are unwholesome words. Gossip. And let me define it so that there's no misunderstanding. Gossip is anything bad about somebody you say that you intend to harm them with. doesn't matter if it's true or not. My grandma raised me. My grandma loved Jesus. And she said to me what I'm sure your grandma has said to you, Ronnie, if you don't have anything good to say, don't say anything at all. Why would we want that filth to come out of our mouths? Taking God's name in vain. Teasing. Which sometimes seems like there's some ulterior motives behind it. Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of our mouths. James, the Lord's half-brother, says, with our mouths we both bless and curse. And then he, he, he pleads to brothers, these things should not be. Our mouths are a wonderful tool to bless God with. Our mouths are a wonderful tool to encourage and exhort God's people with. But, but if our mouths are corrupt... then we can't be used by the Lord in the ways that we want to. I worked for a a guy many, many years ago. I'm talking 40 or more years ago. He was a really good guy. But he had the worst breath ever. He dressed nice. He looked good. And he really was a nice guy. But his breath would knock over a grown man. And you could start smelling it when you walked into his office. Well, that's how unwholesome talk smells to Jesus. And we've got to put it off so that we can wear our new clothes and look better. Why is it so hard to say good things to people? Why is it so hard to be edifying why do we always have to look for the well there's something behind the scenes we got to deal with this part of our heart because until we do no matter how good you think you look the truth is is that you don't look good could it be that we just like shocking people or we just like gossiping about people or we just like getting involved in ungodly conversations Remember, that's the old you, and now things have to change. This is as practical as instruction can be. You want to know what the formula is for a happy life, for a satisfied life? It's being filled with God's Spirit 
and honoring him in all that we say and do. And that's why verse 30 says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Paul will say in another place, do not quench the Spirit of God. Whenever we're using this kind of language, whenever we're letting anger get the best of us, all the things that we've talked about tonight, and by the way, we'll continue to talk about in subsequent chapters. When we're doing those things, then we have no access to power at all. We're on our own, and then the best we can do is the best we can do. And I always tell you, the best we can do apart from Christ is really not good at all. So what do we do? we got to stay plugged into the source of power. The minute you start lying, the minute you start stealing, the minute you start gossiping or using foul language, the minute your anger boils over, you might as well just unplug yourself from Jesus because there is no power available for you because you have not only quenched the spirit, but this word grieve in verse 30 is a very strong word. Can you imagine the God who died for you? The another comforter or counselor that Jesus promised in his absence, who comes to live in you, Christ in us, the hope of glory. Can you imagine grieving him? Can you imagine that kind of ingratitude? Whenever we're doing these things, Paul says, we're grieving the Holy Spirit who sealed us for that appointment in eternity. He continues in verse 31, Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. You can't get dressed up with all that other stuff. Now, the get rid is important. It's a simple and straightforward command. This isn't one of those things where you say, okay, well, God, you, you need to work on me. You need to help me. God, take this away from me. No, God's saying, you get rid of it. So often when you've got a problem, we say, God, why won't you take this away? If you could hear his voice, he would say, I already did. Well, when did you take it away? I did that on the cross. Well, then why am I still being bothered by these things? And the answer is because we haven't gotten rid of it and given it to him. Get rid of all bitterness. And bitterness is a tough one. If you're holding on to unforgiveness, you have bitterness. If you're focused on what people have done to you in your past, remember the old you is supposed to be dead. If you're bitter still towards your parents, and you could have had the worst parents in the world, but if you're bitter still toward them, well, that's the old man or the old woman coming back to life. When you were placed in the ground, spiritually speaking, the old you is gone. I've shared this with you before, but I love open casket funerals. And the reason I love it is because it's such a powerful tool to communicate a message. You know, we walk by an open casket in a funeral. And we're too nice to say it out loud, but we're all thinking it. Doesn't look like her. Doesn't look like him. As Christians, we say, no, I know that's not them. They're not there. What if the person in that casket could hear you or could know what you were thinking? You say, well, that's silly, Pastor Ron. They couldn't do that because they're dead. That's my point exactly. If you're really dead in Christ and now alive in the newness of life, why does anything from your past continue to haunt you in your present? I know we're all shaped by our experiences. I get that. But the real believer says those things don't influence me not for one more minute of one more day. They used to. And I was angry. But then I died. And I was born again. And I have so much to be grateful for. So much to be thankful for. And in fact, Jesus used every one of those hurts. Every, every bit of that pain. And you used it to make me into the man or the woman that you've created me to be. My dad... 
I can't remember him ever telling me he loved me. Now, I don't doubt that he did. But men didn't talk like that. At least in his generation and before. His dad never told him. My dad complimented me from time to time, especially when it came to sports, especially baseball. But every time he said something good, there was always a but. And then he would be critical. And he would get so frustrated with me. Ronnie, you're never going to make it. You're never going to amount to anything, he would say, in his frustration. When I got saved in 1991, I'm so glad that old man was put to death. Because from that point forward, I could honestly and effectively pray for my dad. And I could do it because it was a new me. And my dad, as most of you know, gave his life to Christ on his deathbed and I'm going to see him in heaven. And instead of focusing on the old dad and the things that he did to the old me, I'd rather focus on the fact that when he sees me in heaven, he's going to tell me he loves me. And he's not going to have any criticism at all. I remember Paula never forgets this. We drove down to see my dad one last time before we hit the road to come to San Antonio, Texas. And I looked at him and said, Dad, we're, we're leaving. Where are you going? Going to Texas, going to San Antonio. Why would you go there? Well, Dad, we're going there to start a church. He wanted to know how much that paid. <laughs> and when I told him, Dad, he didn't pay anything, at least certainly not at the beginning. He just looked at me and said, well, that's stupid. Why would you do that? That gave me an opportunity to witness to my dad. Get rid of all bitterness. Get rid of rage, anger, brawling, and slander. All forms of malice. Choose to walk in the spirit instead of the flesh because that's the new clothing that God has for you. Looks pretty good. Look at verse 32. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. I'm going to close with a very, very quick story. My friend Bob Davis, pastor and Post Falls, Idaho, was one of my teachers in Bible college and one of the godliest men I know. He's a nut, he's crazy, but he is so steady, so consistent. He tells about a situation he incurred in the Sudan. He said a village had been destroyed, 67 of the men had been taken prisoners, some of the women had been beaten and raped, and the children were taken from the village to be sold into slavery. In the middle of all that, he listened as one of the Sudanese survivors, a woman, prayed this. She said, God, help us forgive because forgiving is important because you have forgiven us. Help us not to take revenge. That's what Paul had in mind when he talks about the old man versus the new man. Pastor Chuck, who is the founder of Calvary Chapel, told the story, verse 32 was the first verse that his mother ever made him memorize. By the time he was three, he had it memorized and he remembered it his whole life. This was the verse his mom picked out for him. And he told the story one time of when his young daughter was misbehaving in such a way that a spanking was inevitable. Now, Pastor Chuck was a softy. He talked a good game, but, oh, he was a softy. And so he didn't want to spank her at all, but he knew he was going to have to. And so he took this three-year-old daughter, and he said to her, do you know what the Bible says? 
about this situation. Now, he was going to quote Ephesians 6.1, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Instead, she blurted out, I do know what the Bible says. It says, Be kind and tenderhearted, forgiving each other, as in Christ God forgave you. <laughs> you see, he had her memorize the same verse first. He didn't know she was going to use it against him, but I will say, <laughs> the way he tells the story, she got off without a spank in that time. <laughs> a lot of the stuff that I talked about tonight is behavior that we've grown so accustomed to that it feels like those old, filthy clothes. And we've gotten so used to them that we'd rather wear them than the new clothes Jesus paid for. If you want to walk in the Spirit, please take to heart what Paul told us tonight. Please be aware of the imperative that changing is in our lives. We can't be the same. There's no excuse to be the same. And every time that you let your flesh win, you're going to mess up your new clothes. We don't have to do better or try better. We just have to be the new man and the new woman Christ created us to be. Pretty practical section of scripture. Believe it, obey it, and just see how things change in your life. Would you pray with me? Can we get the worship team come back up for one final song? Father, we thank you.